Good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's great to see so many people. I, I admit I was a little worried when I heard that Ted Cruz was speaking at this exact moment at the Century Center. Tom, it's a hard thing to compete with Ted Cruz, but people chose well, I think. So I'm delighted to see all of you here at our annual Kushma Center lecture. We have waited until the last moment of the academic year to have this lecture. Um, thank you all for accommodating the rescheduled date, and we're just delighted that it's happening. Uh, my name is Kathleen Sproz Cummings. I'm the director of the Kushma Center for the Study of American Catholicism. I'm a faculty member in American Studies and History here at Notre Dame. I'm excited to see so many friends of the Kushma Center here and also a few new faces. So please, um, uh, after this event, please come to events again. Come to all of our events. This is a very special Kushma event. Since Martin Marty delivered the first Kushma Center lecture in 1984, this <coughs> series has provided an opportunity for the Notre Dame community to hear from some of the most renowned scholars and public intellectuals from across the country on topics of religion and public life. This year's Kushwa Center Lecture is particularly special in that it is the last in a series of events celebrating the 40th anniversary of the Kushwa Center's founding. Specifically, over the course of the past academic year, we have hosted discussions that have highlighted the achievements of the Center's three previous directors. In September, we welcomed back to campus the Kushwa Center's founding director, Jay Dolan, Professor Emeritus in History, um, for our annual Hibernian Lecture in which the speaker discussed Jay's role as one of the leading scholars of the Irish American experience and how his work on that topic has continued to shape the field. In October, we hosted a panel discussion on Hispanic Catholics in 20th century uh, Catholic parish life to celebrate the contributions of my immediate predecessor, Timothy Matavina, who served as director of Kushwa from 2002 to 2012 and is professor of theology here, and also now co-director of the Institute for Latino Studies at Notre Dame. And finally, this afternoon's lecture was planned with the center's second director in mind, uh, R. Scott Appleby, who is now serving as the founding dean of the Keogh School of Global Affairs, which is set to open in August 2017. As many in the room know well, Dean Appleby is professor of history here at Notre Dame, who directed the Kroc Institute from 2000 to 2014. What is less well known, and what is our in, in ulterior motive in sponsoring this and other events, is to let everyone know that before the Kroc Institute and the Keogh School, uh, Scott was the director of the Kushwa Center from 1994 to 2002, and in fact was recruited to Notre Dame's faculty with that purpose in mind, to take up that job that he did so well for so many years. As director of Kushwa, Scott expanded the research profile of the center through a variety of conferences and seminars, and he became a media commentator in high demand and really propelled the center into a more public role beyond the academy and modeled for uh, many of us how a scholar could bring a carefully nuanced um, historical perspective to bear on national discussions of <coughs> issues ranging from Catholicism in America to global religious violence. What perhaps stands out as Scott's most substantial and sustained initiative at Kushwa was the Kushwa Center Studies of Catholicism in the 20th Century America book series, which consists of eight volumes published with Cornell University Press. And this series represents the culmination of a multi-year exploration of previously underexplored Catholic contributions to civic culture, political identity, to labor unions and social ethics, to education, healthcare, and other enterprises led by Catholic women, and to American Catholic spirituality and practice in the 20th century. Um, all of the books in that series are available for purchase along with Professor Segrus outside um, uh, after the lecture. And I wanted to particularly highlight Catholics in the American Century, which is a book that Scott and I edited, which contains some wonderful essays that talk about ways to integrate the Catholic experience into the larger American story. And one of the uh, best essays in this book, and the author with whom it was such a pleasure to work, was Professor Tom Segru. And so it was clear to us that in thinking about an event that could honor Scott's legacy and contribution, that we would invite uh, uh, tonight's, today's lecturer here to speak about the integration of Catholicism and modern American history. So very pleased to introduce him now. Thomas Segru is Professor of Social and Cultural Analysis and History at New York University, a specialist in 20th century American politics, urban history, civil rights, and race. Sabrew was educated at Columbia, King's College, Cambridge, and Harvard, where he earned his PhD in 1992. 
Before moving to NYU last fall, he taught at the University of Pennsylvania for 24 years, where he was the David Boyce Professor of History and Sociology and founding director of the Penn Social Science and Policy Forum. Professor Sagru is the author of four books and editor of two others. He has published over 40 articles in a variety of journals and edited collections, has advised dozens of dissertations in history, social welfare, American civilization, sociology, and history and sociology of science. His first book, The Origins of the Urban Crisis, won the Bancroft Prize in American History, the Philip Taft Prize in Labor History, and the President's Book Award of the Social Science History Association. Those are just a few of his honors. His newest book, co-authored with Glenda Gilmore of Yale University, is These United States, A Nation in the Making, 1890 to the Present. Professor Sagru is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, an elected member of the Society of American Historians, and past president of both the Urban History Association and the Social Science History Association. I could go on, but I think now I'll turn it over to Dr. Sagru and leave as much time as possible for his lecture and a few questions afterwards. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sagru. Thanks very much, Kathy, for the kind and um, inflated introduction. Um, I appreciate that. Um, and I'm delighted that we were able to reschedule. Um, I was supposed to be here in mid-February when a blizzard blew through South Bend, um, preventing me from flying out of New York. And then I thought back to the Catholicism in the American Century Conference in 2008 uh, that uh, I attended here. Um, and the second morning of the conference, there was an earthquake. Uh, uh, something pretty uh, bizarre and unusual it woke me up from uh, my deep slumber at the Morris Inn. So I'm worried a little bit about the third thing since these things travel in threes. Maybe it's Ted Cruz to see in campus? I'm not sure. Uh, in any case, it's, it's both a real honor to be here to deliver this Kushwa Center lecture, um, and it's also really intimidating to be in the presence of so many Catholic historians. As someone um, who um, uh, was proudly educated in Catholic schools from first grade to 12th grade, um, but who is not a Catholic historian, maybe at best a fellow traveler uh, of Catholic historians. But it's it's a real honor, especially, to uh, offer a lecture in tribute to Scott Appleby, who is um, a towering figure in American Catholic and religious history, but also in international relations and in really so much more. Um, I don't know Scott particularly well, but I'll tell you a little bit about how I know him. I know him primarily by his words and his deeds. Um, as a major historian of Catholicism, uh, as a scholar, uh, who works on the relationship of religion uh, and modernity, as someone who's contributed both as an academic and as a public intellectual to ecumenical dialogue, uh, as a major scholar of religion, ethics, and international relation. He's also a leader par excellence, the, uh, one of the key people in the rise and success of the Kushwa Center for so many years, um, as longtime director of Notre Dame's renowned international relations program, and of course as the founding dean of the new, soon to be open Keough School of Global Affairs. The type of scholarship that Scott has produced, and I've I, I don't think I've read every last thing, but I've read most of what Scott has written. The type of scholarship that uh, Scott has produced, as well as his record of leadership um, here at Notre Dame, and really nationally and internationally, um, and his indef indefatigable work as a distinguished public commentator on so many issues, all of these point to one overwhelming conclusion about um, his disposition as a person, as a scholar, and as a leader. That is, Scott is a connector, someone who connects on a personal level, bringing people together, an institutional connector, using the resources of Notre Dame especially um, to bring uh, together uh, the general public, uh, students, and faculty, especially providing visiting scholars with the resources to conduct research and do their cutting edge work on the history of Catholicism and to do it well. Uh, and someone who in his scholarship and work displays a kind of rare synthetic imagination, one that we just don't see very much of in the academic world. Really, in some ways, to use Isaiah Berlin's uh, uh, famous metaphor, we have our scholars who are hedgehogs and foxes. The hedgehog, a necessary figure in the academic world who digs deeply following a narrow trench. 
the fox who ranges widely, uh, exploring and, range, and, and ranging and moving about. And Scott is clearly someone uh, who is, uh, so has that truly synthetic approach to scholarship um, that foxes do. And he's also ecumenical, someone who both practices and preaches dialogue across artificially rigid boundaries, whether they be denominational or religious boundaries, uh, or national boundaries, uh, or even boundaries within the discipline of history itself. I, 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 I don't want to make Scott blush, but I can keep going and say that in some ways, Scott's approach, this way of connecting, this way about thinking about the local and the global, of connecting uh, an institution of a higher education in the world, makes him in some respects one of the truest of Catholic intellectuals who embodies the spirit of Gaudium et Spes, that is, the ch reflecting the Vatican Council's teaching and guidance on the role of the church in the world so powerfully. His scholarly interests speak to a broad internationalism, a universalism that characterizes the best of Catholic social teaching. This afternoon, in thinking about Scott, I also want to reflect on the fact that um, he's known uh, as being a very good editor. And I can attest uh, to that uh, as uh, someone who contributed a small piece to one of the volumes in the Catholicism in the, uh, in, in the 20th, century, 20th Century America series, which I'll in shorthand call the Kushwa Center series. I'm going to reflect on the relationship of Catholic history to American history in the 20th century. Um, and I'm going to do it by thinking about the books in that series, but also um, reflecting on the ways in which we can take Scott's leadership and vision as an editor and use it to shape the next generation of Catholic and modern American historiography. To embark on this task of thinking about Catholicism in the 20th century, the Kushwa Center series, and where it might go or its successor might go in the future, um, I, I had an unusual assignment when um, I accepted this uh, lecture. Um, of the hundreds of public lectures I've given in the last 20 years, this one stands alone, I think, in one fundamental respect. That is, I can't think of a single occasion in which I was assigned homework by my host. A lot of homework. Uh, Kathy Cummings asked me to read all eight books in the Koshwa series. Um, that's a few thousand pages uh, about uh, the amount of reading that I might assign to a group of bright undergraduates in a semester long upper level <laughs> class. Uh, I had read some of them before, uh, several of them admittedly, but I had to reread and read several that I hadn't read. Um, so I guess we could say that this afternoon is my final exam. Uh, so professors Appleby and Cummings, um, I'm not going to be a grade grubber, I promise. But regardless of how uh, I do in this class, I've learned a lot. Um, uh, I hope that after all my hard work, I earn an A. Uh, at least for effort. Uh, uh, but um, I had the chance to read a really impressive set of books. I have my favorites, and I have my arguments with a few of the authors in the series, and I'm not going to go into um, either, although I think you'll probably get a sense by the end of my talk about a few of my favorites. Um, the authors in the Kushwa Center series contribute to labor history. They contribute uh, to ethnic uh, and immigration history. They contribute to a field that I find myself uh, perhaps most closely intellectually akin to, the social history of politics, bringing together the grassroots, or we could say maybe in Catholic history, the pew roots uh, 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 together with regional, national, uh, and sometimes international concerns. There are books that deal with the intellectual and cultural history of Catholicism, of Catholic theology, which infuses many of the books in the series. Um, that deal in really imaginative ways, in ways that were eye-opening for me as someone who is not a Catholic historian on everyday Catholic spirituality and devotional practices, and deal with questions of gender, family, and sexuality. In other words, questions that are central not just to the history of Catholicism in the United States or in the world, but questions that are central uh, to modern American history or modern historiography. In other words, the books in this series really represent, um, in, in fundamental ways, um, the historiographical transformation that has remade uh, American history over the last quarter century or so. I came away from my assignment with some pretty clear lessons. One, and again, I, I'm, I'm puffing up Scott a little bit for one more minute, but it's, Scott's, it's easy to see in these eight books Scott's powerful role as editor. 
Nearly every one of the authors relied on Kushwa Center's support, whether in the form of research funds or the opportunity to present their work in progress at conferences or to seminars in front of a remarkable group of scholars and intellectuals that Scott and the other Kushwa Center directors over the years um, have convened here at Notre Dame. In their acknowledgments, and acknowledgments are always, of course, the first part of a book that we look at uh, to get a sense of the pedigree of the person who's writing it. In the acknowledgments, um, the authors laud Scott's intellectual companionship, in the words of one, his gracious invitations, uh, in the words of another, his unflagging support, in the, word, uh, the words of a third, and his searching reading of uh, their manuscripts, in the word of a fourth. Um, I can attest to this because I wrote what I thought was a really nice, neat, elegant, uh, finely crafted essay. I wrote it again and rewrote it ag again a third time in response to the comments that were generated at the Catholicism in the American Century Conference here. Uh, and when I patted myself on my back for my glorious achievement, um, I got a page and a half or so of single space comments with some really hard questions from Scott, basically saying, Sagru, ramp it up to the next level. You can do better than what you've done uh, with this piece that you submitted me, which I was pretty proud of. Uh, and, and lo and behold, I incorporated the changes, at least partially. I answered his questions, I hope somewhat completely. Uh, and I think the essay is a lot stronger for that, giving me a firsthand experience of his editorial skills. The Kushwa Center series uh, uh, demonstrates, above all, that American Catholic history uh, is one of the most dynamic subfields of modern American history today. That it's in a period captured, I think, by that moment, especially in the, uh, in the first decade of the 21st century when most of these books were published, uh, capturing a moment at which Catholic history, uh, the Catholic history of the United States, was really in a period of takeoff. When I commented on Catholicism in the American century and looked at Catholicism in the 60s at the conference that was eventually published as one of those eight books, I also suggested and still believe that Catholic history is still too unfamiliar to mainstream 20th century US historians who woefully neglect, I think, to uh, the detriment of our subfields, uh, some of the uh, key insights of work in Catholic history. But the series pushes us, and us meaning me, people who are not primarily Catholic historians, to take Catholic history seriously. And for anyone who follows my path and reads all these books in their entirety, um, you will discover a, a profound challenge, really, uh, to uh, the work that we uh, 20th century historians have been doing. The title of my talk this afternoon is a deliberate reflection on this point, that Catholic history, despite uh, the uh, incredible fertility of scholarship in the field um, still remains um, too far out on the margins uh, and needs to be brought into the center of our understanding of modern American society, politics, social life, and culture. I began with the metaphor out of the ghetto, um, and I didn't like it after I came up with it, but um, it refers to the way, uh, at least traditionally, of how Catholic historians, writers, intellectuals um, have described the transformation of American Catholicism over the 20th century, describing American Catholics' uh, complicated encounter with uh, modern America. Many Catholic historians uh, describe early 20th and mid 20th century Catholicism as a subculture uh, of American society. It's still not fully integrated into the mainstream. Uh, the metaphor ghetto uh, uh, suggesting a way in which Catholicism is still cordoned off from American society. I think as more work comes out in American Catholic history, uh, the, the notion of Catholics being uh, a, a subculture and ghettoized has been complicated enormously. Um, but I also use the phrase out of the ghetto um, as an exhortation about the relationship of Catholic history and modern American historiography. It's clear uh, from the Kushwa Center series and from so much of the important work being done by people supported by the Kushwa Center and other historians of Catholicism uh, that uh, Catholic historians have left the ghetto a long time ago, uh, leaving the narrow internalist focus of denominational religious histories following their counterparts in Jewish history, uh, in evangelical Christian history and mainstream Protestant history to some extent, uh, following them and uh, leaving the internalist focus of the dominant 
denominational religious history uh, behind, or even more powerfully, combining a focus on doctrine, belief, and practice with an engagement with larger questions about culture, society, and politics. So it's now time for modern American historians to leave their own ghetto, a ghetto that still very much favors the secular over the religious, that downplays beliefs and devotion or treats them as epiphenomenal, and that overlooks the crucial role of religious institutions uh, and actors and activists uh, in shaping politics, ideas, and public policy in modern America. So what I want to do for the next few minutes, uh, not giving you potted book reviews of each of these volumes, is to think about them for a moment as a collective project. Then I'm going to follow by looking forward from this collective project to what we might call American Catholic History 2.0, looking at the major currents in the, in the fields of US historiography and Catholic historiography and suggesting new and exciting directions, some of which I'm sure are already underway. For younger scholars in the room, especially graduate students, I'm going to humbly, but I hope persuasively, suggest some directions uh, that you uh, might go in now or later in your careers. And I know from lunch with some of you that you're starting to go in those directions. The promise of Catholic history is this. It cuts across many of the traditional boundaries of American historiography. And boundaries are a theme that I'm going to return to. Catholic history undermines binaries that still shape how we, 20th century American historians, teach and write about American history. And this is because one of the fundamental takeaways of this body of scholarship on Catholic history is uh, that Catholics themselves resist easy categorization socially, politically, ethnically, and spatially. We often talk about Catholicism as a whole, but what we learn from the grassroots social histories of Irish workers uh, and their bosses and their priests on the waterfront of New York City, what we learn about Catholic labor activists uh, and priests and parishioners in St. Paul, what we learn uh, about those fighting uh, for political representation in Providence, three of the really interesting books in this series, what we learn about them uh, is that Ultimately, Catholic history is breaking down all sorts of boundaries. Uh, it's blurring together or combining the personal and the political, to use a commonly used binary uh, in American history. It combines the familial and the familial with the local and the national. It's thinking both writ small and, and large simultaneously. One of the most exciting things about Catholic historiography and about uh, the ways in which um, some of the most interesting 20th century American historians are thinking about the field is that they are combining the grassroots and the top down, the bottom up uh, and the national and international. And Catholic history, I think, does this better than all but a handful of American historians. All of these books are written in a way that has an eye toward the particular, the distinctive, uh, about Catholic history, belief, devotion, and practice, but at the same time uh, has an eye toward uh, uh, the larger scale, whether it be the region, whether it be the labor market, whether it be modern American capitalism, whether it be the Democratic Party uh, and, and, uh, and socialist labor activism, uh, whether it be uh, uh, changing notions of family and gender and sexuality. All these books, in other words, are content, indeed find it imperative to draw bridges between the distinctive Catholic experience in the United States uh, and the ways in which Catholics interface, interact, transform, and are transformed by modern American society. One of the ways in which most of these books, not all because some of the books focus on different issues, but one of the ways in which most of these books uh, uh, bring this distinctive perspective to bear is thinking about geographic scale in American life. The brilliant Michigan historian, 20th century US historian, who to the best of my knowledge has written not a word about Catholicism, um, Matthew Lassiter, um, describes what he calls the spatial turn in American political history. Catholic history is fundamentally spatial, fundamentally territorial in its orientation because of the ways that Catholics understand uh, geography and their place in community. 
we've all known for now going on 20 years, maybe slightly more than 20 years, from the brilliant work of your own dean, John McGreevy, about the importance of parish boundaries in shaping not just the experience of American Catholics in our major cities, but also the ways in which those cities develop and transform, and especially the history of race and civil rights. Catholics, more than nearly any other religious group in American society, other than uh, perhaps Orthodox Jews uh, of, of certain sects and Mormons, who also think territorially in interesting ways, um, Catholics, more so than nearly any other group in American society, create legibility through the drawing and maintenance of boundaries. My late parents, both native Detroiters, may their memory be a blessing, uh, grew up on the city's west side but they did not define their neighborhoods by the compass, east or west, but rather by their parish. In thinking about the ways in which Catholics understood territory, we see, for example, in Mary uh, Wingert's book on St. Paul, the ways in which uh, uh, Catholics in the Twin Cities saw their identities, Minneapolis versus St. Paul, but also saw themselves in terms of their ethnic identities, German and Irish, but also saw themselves as very much rooted in the territorial consciousness of Catholic parish and of the other institutions many tied into parishes uh, that defined uh, their communities and their identities. Boundaries matter enormously in American history. They matter for the creation of a sense of community and identity. And this is another major theme that courses through uh, the books in the Kushwa Center series. That is, uh, uh, boundaries uh, and territory are essential for creating a sense of community, of family, and of self of Catholics for most uh, of American history. But boundaries are also about the allocation of power and resources across metropolitan space. And this is one way in which thinking about Catholic boundaries, municipal boundaries, and the boundaries that allocate things like public education, infrastructure, or how much we pay for them in the form of taxes need to be thought about uh, in combination. Uh, next, the next thread that runs through most of these books, all these books actually, um, is the importance of institutions. Um, there are movements in political science, in sociology, and in American history to put more emphasis on the roles of institutions in American life. Those taken for granted formations, somewhere between everyday experience and macro level government or political economy or religious denominations that essentially structure and shape people's everyday lives. And we see in all of these books um, the critical importance of institutions and institution building in the history of the modern United States. I'm going to say something provocative on institutions and institution building, but I think it's intellectually defensible, much more so now that I'm fortified by those thousands of pages uh, in, those, uh, in those eight books. One of the most important currents, and I think problematic currents, in modern American historiography uh, at least since the 1970s and 1980s, is an emphasis on individual agency. Histories of race, of civil rights, of gender, of labor, of popular culture, of social movements, all have been profoundly shaped by an emphasis on the ways in which individuals can challenge, subvert, transgress, or resist uh, uh, larger societal forces, usually those that are oppressing them. This individualist orientation reflects a distinctively modern American and modern secular or Protestant American understanding of how social change happens. It might make sense when it's applied to the perfectionist Protestants who are at the center of the abolition movement uh, or who are shaping some of the reform efforts of the early 20th century, this emphasis on individual agency. Um, it might make sense if you believe that you have an unmediated relationship to God, if you have Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior responding directly to your prayers uh, as your companion, as your friend. But this notion of individual agency makes much less sense uh, if you look at the lens through the 20 or 25% of the American population in the 20th century that was Catholic. It's easy to, to look out at the question of individual agency, one that 
not surprisingly emerges at the same moment that microeconomics uh, and uh, 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 market-based explanations of human behavior that emphasize choice become the currency in the modern academy, uh, it might make sense with that epistemology of how society and the economy are organized to focus on individual agency. But I would contend that this is a profoundly un-Catholic way of thinking about politics of activism and social change. If Catholics' relationship with God is mediated through family, through community, through the parish, through the priesthood, and through the magisterium, the very notion that individuals acting alone, out of conscience, agents of their own fate, is in some ways profoundly foreign. This orientation toward the institutional, the familial, the communal, shapes uh, currents running through almost all of the books in the Kushwa Center series. This emphasis on institutions, on connections, on sociability rather than in individuality, um, in many respects, makes uh, Catholic historians, even those who are writing in a deeply humanistic tradition, intuitively social scientists. They are, in many respects, uh, thinking in the ways that historical political scientists or scholars of networks uh, in sociology are thinking about the connections between individuals and society, individuals in the economy, individuals and social change. Another major theme that runs through the Kushwa Center series that was quite striking to me um, uh, is um, its emphasis on the heterogeneity of the Catholic experience. That is, uh, we can't talk about Catholicism in the singular after reading this series of books. There are common threads, an emphasis on authority, institutions, connection. But the ways in which these manifest and relate to larger currents in American society is not fixed and unchanging. Uh, the Catholic Church, and I need not say this, I probably shouldn't even bother to say it in a group of, uh, uh, overwhelmingly group of Catholic historians, but it's a dynamic institution. Uh, something that actually most American historians who don't know anything about Catholicism uh, should perhaps um, learn a, a little bit more from. That is, uh, despite uh, its uh, long history and the importance of tradition, uh, it's a tradition that is malleable and gets uh, reshaped and reordered uh, in specific political, cultural, and economic contexts. One way uh, in which we can think about this, uh, and this is an issue that um, I'm particularly interested in that I reflected on in my contribution to uh, the uh, Kushwa Center series and my short essay on Catholicism in the 1960s, is the ways in which a growing segment of American Catholics over the course of the 20th century, many of them, but not all of them, allied with movements on the political right came to make their peace with a form of, uh, uh, of economic libertarianism, uh, a pro-market ideology um, that stands in sharp contrast with the views of the economy and the market uh, that played out in Providence, St. Paul, uh, and some of the other places that are in this series. Um, Catholics across the political spectrum, and this is a riff in some ways off of what I said about agency, Catholics across the political spectrum, beginning in the Cold War uh, and continuing into the late 20th century and the early 21st century, have come increasingly to embrace the language of choice, the rhetoric of the market, notions that would have made many of their parents and grandparents and great-grandparents, their Catholic school teachers, uh, their pastors, uh, their, their bishops, and their popes um, pretty uncomfortable. In the realm of religious practice, Catholics over the course of this period have also uh, become in some ways more like other Americans, uh, at least to some extent, in uh, their growing allergy or suspicion to traditionally constituted authority. This is a history that's spelled out, um, I will say, my favorite of the books, or maybe one of my two favorite of the books in this series, um, Leslie Tentler's extraordinary book on Catholics and contraception, um, as she shows how both endogenous changes in Catholic theology and exogenous shifts uh, in sexual practices and ideology in post-war America led many Catholics to uh, embrace the notion of the primacy of individual conscience when it came uh, to sex and reproduction, a theme I'm going to return to in a little while. Next, I mentioned that uh, one of the major uh, 
currents running through this Kushwa Center series is a challenge to tradi traditional binaries. And Catholic history in all of these books on so many levels challenges the fundamental frameworks of 20th century US political history. Despite a lot of political historians who know better, most histories of 20th century America still rely on the binary opposition of left versus right or liberal versus conservative. There are some younger scholars, uh, including a couple of my students, who are getting interested in the question of independent and moderate politics uh, as a way of trying to break up this binary a little bit. Uh, but, uh, and there's also a growing interest in the relationship of religion and politics right and left. Uh, and uh, uh, these books and dissertations, as good as they are, primarily leave Catholics out and also leave out the fact that if you think about political binaries, it's pretty hard to make sense uh, in different moments for different reasons uh, of the interesting political configuration of uh, Roman Catholics in the United States. Catholics are hard to cram into political boxes. Even if we as scholars and journalists and political pundits uh, and students and teachers uh, like the convenience of easily labeled political boxes to cram people in historically. Um, let me just offer uh, a couple of examples. Catholics and socialism. This is a thread that runs through uh, the, uh, some of the books in the series, particularly those dealing with that very fertile period uh, of the rise of urbanization and industrialization of, of efforts to reform them in the United States and the mass immigration, particularly of Roman Catholics, to uh, uh, the United States. It's easy, as many scholars have done, to focus on uh, the centrality of Catholicism to uh, opposition to socialism and radicalism. A lot of work, uh, particularly on the McCarthy period, uh, 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 posits the, the relationship between Catholics and the Cold War ideology, particularly of uh, Joseph McCarthy. Uh, this, of course, there's plenty of evidence for this. Catholics praying for the conversion of Russia when uh, Francis Spellman used the mass media to warn against Soviet atheism and materialism. But this uh, uh, approach ignores the ways in which uh, socialism, anti-communism, and Catholicism, and political conservatism cannot easily uh, be put into these conventional boxes. Yes, Catholics did play into the hands of the political right, uh, witness uh, a strong Catholic support for Joseph McCarthy. But that obscures the variety of Catholic anti-socialism, which wasn't necessarily on the right. Uh, a particularly uh, important point made in Wingard's study of St. Paul uh, and uh, uh, in Fisher's study of uh, the Irish waterfront in New York. Uh, Catholic anti-socialism was sometimes, uh, 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 in its fundamental contours, sometimes more similar to the socialism that Catholics were protesting uh, than to uh, the atheist atheistic uh, Soviet communism uh, that Catholics pretty much across the political spectrum align themselves against. Even as Catholics repudiated the materialism uh, of communism, they often embraced positions that in the conventional binary of the modern United States might be described as falling on the political left, even if that division doesn't make particular sense. Many of the books in the Kushwa Center series also shed light on other important dimensions of modern American uh, political history, particularly the relationship of Catholicism and the Democratic Party and the New Deal. Another one of those relationships that's often taken for granted, but assumes that Catholicism is one uniform thing, and assumes that New Deal liberalism is one uniform thing, uh, and doesn't look at the ways in which they entangle, interact, challenge each other, uh, and in, in many respects, um, find themselves in a complicated, uh, um, relationship of convenience, of strategy, of theology, and of ideology, uh, but sometimes they find themselves looking across a political chasm of mutual suspicion. The New Deal's emphasis on state and local control, for example, uh, maintaining uh, local power, and even at a moment of the agglomeration of the power of the federal government, reflects uh, to an extent that may be surprising the Catholic notion of subsidiarity. 
The notion of, uh, uh, of the New Deal using the power of the state uh, to bolster trade unionism uh, in many respects uh, is consistent with decades of Catholic social teaching on work going back at least uh, to Rerum Novarum. The New Deal's gender politics, uh, which have been the subject of criticism uh, by uh, New Dealers and folks to their left, particularly its emphasis on uh, the gendered nature of the workforce and the family wage, that is unionized working men earning enough to support their families, rang true to the New Deal's enormous Catholic constituency. In other words, when we look at the different dimensions in the New Deal and what seem to be contradictory dimensions in the New Deal social democratic project reflect the fact that Catholics were, uh, uh, other than Southern whites, the most significant constituents in the New Deal coalition. Uh, and they played a role in shaping New Deal legislation and implementing New Deal legislation uh, on the states and local levels, particularly in the parts of the country that had big Catholic populations. So as we uh, look out onto uh, the trajectory of Catholic history, I want to turn now just for a few minutes um, to build on what I see as the formidable contributions of the Catholicism in the American Century Kushwa Center series uh, to look at the ways in which um, a, a new generation of Catholic historians might build from some of these important books uh, looking forward uh, to uh, reshaping both the field of Catholic history and modern American history setting forth in new directions, building on the best of the old. I'm going to suggest four. Catholics in the world, Catholics in sexuality, Catholics in capitalism, and Catholics in the post-1960s years, uh, uh, particularly the 1970s and 1980s, a uh, period that I think is incredibly important for the history of Catholicism. First, Catholics in the world and the world and American Catholics. One of the limitations uh, of the, uh, the Kushwa Center series is uh, that most of the books do not look at Catholicism outside the boundaries of communities or outside the boundaries of the United States. This is not a surprise because until the early 2000s, only traditional diplomatic historians, uh, for the most part, uh, focused on uh, the history of the United States uh, in a global context or its relationship to the world. In other words, uh, because the series builds on the best of American social and political history from the period from the 1980s up through the early 20, 21st century, it shouldn't come as a surprise uh, that the globalizing initiative uh, of American historians is not really reflected in the series, but there's a lot of incredibly exciting work being done by mostly younger American historians now bringing the history of the United States uh, into a transnational or global perspective. I'll say there is a noteworthy exception in the Kushwa Center series, and that is the wonderful volume uh, by former Kushwa Center director Timothy Matavina and uh, uh, Gary Reeb Estrella um, that uh, looks at Mexican-American Catholicism and situates it in a transnational context of Catholic devotional practices in Latin America and the United States, a really important exception to this bigger story. Um, but there's more, I think, that the uh, that uh, a next generation of Catholic historians or Kushwa uh, book series 2.0 can do to think about the relationship of the U.S. and the world. We think, for example, of some really influential books of the last 15 years or so. Daniel Rogers has written on the transatlantic uh, currents of progressivism, or a younger scholar, Daniel Imawar from Northwestern, uh, has looked at the global circulation of American notions of economic development and the ways in which they play out uh, in Asia and Africa as well as here in the United States. Or I have to confess, I just picked up uh, the first copy of John McGreevy's new book uh, on uh, Jesuits in the world, uh, one that I think points to a fruitful new direction of integrating uh, the history of American Jesuits or the, the history of American uh, Catholic uh, congregations and their place outside the United States. Building on those insights, I want to suggest a few possible avenues of inquiry. One is exploring American Catholic encounters with the world in moments of intersection and divergence. That is, when Catholicism and American foreign policy initiatives uh, go together hand in hand, and when they uh, depart from each other. Again, reflecting the ways in which Catholicism and uh, mainstream American international history uh, are sometimes paired and are sometimes not. 
In the Cold War era, the United States was involved in exporting the New Deal internationally, and Catholic activists and religious orders were involved in collaborating with their brethren uh, in various parts of the world, particularly the developing world. American Catholics and intellectuals and politicians uh, and their counterparts in the democratizing world of post-Second World War II Europe uh, is another area where I think there are really interesting and rich possibilities for exploration, looking at democracy and reconstruction. What about the relationship of American Catholic politicians, intellectuals, writers, uh, and, uh, uh, and even bishops and pastors uh, with uh, the Christian democratic parties of Europe and the projects that they're engaged in? Or maybe in a darker story, what about the relationship of American Catholic activists and intellectuals to Catholic leaders and regimes that were fundamentally anti-democratic? whether Franco Spain, No Din Diem's Vietnam, uh, or the various American-backed authoritarian regimes in Guatemala, Chile, and Argentina. These are all places where Catholic history and American history, I think, can engage in some very fruitful uh, dialogue. Next, Catholics and sexuality. I am waiting. Uh, and I just heard from talking uh, to Jim McCartan uh, uh, in a taxi on, uh, uh, on the way over here uh, this morning. Maybe I'm not going to be waiting as long as I thought I would, but I am waiting for a book that offers a, a rich, multidimensional history of Catholics and sexuality, of Catholics and marriage, of shifting Catholic understandings uh, of sexuality, of shifting Catholic notions of masculinity and femininity and ideas about the body. Um, there's so much that we don't know about the evolution of Catholic theology and everyday practices uh, around uh, questions of sexuality. When does marital sexuality become sacramental? This is a place where Catholic history intersects with some of the most important themes in much recent work in modern American historiography. It intersects with the subfields of the history of gender and sexuality. It intersects with work on medicine, on eugenics, on public health. It intersects with work on the law, especially cutting edge work on marriage and family law. Uh, it intersects uh, with work by historians of science and intellectual historians on the rise and transformation of uh, psychology in the United States, thinking about the ways in which Catholics and uh, mostly secular psychologists began to find common ground in an area that I think uh, is very fruitful for inquiry. One of the most important, controversial, and woefully neglected topics is the history of Catholicism and homosexuality, both in terms of doctrine and lived experience. Again, if you look at the extraordinary boom in the last two decades of work on the history of uh, homosexuality, um, it's attracted some immensely talented historians. Catholicism is lurking in the shadows. Uh, it hasn't, you could say, come out of the closet uh, in many studies, uh, of, uh, uh, especially urban studies of gay and lesbian history. Think about the formative book in the field, George Chauncey's Gay New York. It's full of men whose Catholic backgrounds go almost entirely unmentioned, particularly the Irish and Italian immigrants who were the denizens of the sexual underworlds uh, of the city's wharves and working class taverns. How did the normative Catholic masculinity of Jim Fisher's workers on the Irish waterfront uh, clash with, conflict with, disconnect with, or connect with the gay spaces that were in exactly those same sections of the city. What was happening in those places? Uh, what were the contexts, the territorial battles, the fights, the struggles, or the personal connections that played out in these contested spaces? A series of really interesting questions that we will not be able to answer unless we put Catholics uh, and uh, Catholicism into the mix. How did the Catholic Church respond uh, to uh, changing uh, ideas about sexual practice from changing notions of consent uh, to decisions about censorship. It's striking to me um, in how often the Catholic Church shows up 
in urban gay and lesbian historiography, but usually playing a very simple, flat, and uninteresting role as a censor uh, or as uh, an opponent of, of gay rights and liberation. In Mark Stein's History of Gay and Lesbian Philadelphia, the Archdiocese makes its cameo in the 1950s uh, for its ridiculous opposition to the naming of the, uh, the Walt Whitman Bridge connecting New Jersey and Pennsylvania against Walt Whitman, uh, who they suspected would be uh, an improper role model for uh, Catholic youth. Um, in Timothy Stewart Winter's important new book on Chicago gay politics, Cardinal Bernadin uh, and the Chicago Archdiocese face off gay activists uh, at a moment when they're gaining power in Chicago's political machine. Yet many in Chicago's political machine, including some of its key Catholic leaders, make their peace with gay activists. What's going on there? We don't know from Stuart Winter because he doesn't know enough about the history of Catholicism, of the archdiocese, uh, or of Catholic understandings. A new gay Catholic history will have to move delicately but decisively into sensitive questions including homosexuality in the priesthood, or the church and the AIDS epidemic, topics that have by and large been left to talented but often sometimes scandal-mongering journalists, uh, topics that demand a rigorous historical analysis and a long contextualization in both the lived experience of Catholics as well as Catholic theology uh, and Catholic devotion. Whether heterosexuality or homosexuality, we need a book, really many books, uh, in the spirit of Leslie Tentler's brilliant analysis of Catholics and contraception in the Kushwa Center series, looking at the tensions between Catholic theology and popular practice that explores the lived experience of men and women in the church that has been alternatively welcoming and censorious uh, of gays but also whose teachings on homosexuality differ in pretty profound ways from teachings uh, about homosexuality in mainstream Protestant or evangelical Protestant congregations, just to name two. Next, Catholics, business, and capitalism. This is a place where there's a lot of great stuff in the Kushwa Center series and where there are many insights to build upon, uh, particularly discussions of Catholic critiques uh, of capitalism from Monsignor Ryan to uh, labor organizers uh, uh, trying to find a middle ground between the conservative AFL unions and the often communist CIO unions. We know, of course, from these books and from a whole generation of Catholic intellectual histories uh, about uh, Leo XII and Francis uh, on capitalism and human dignity, but much less on the ways in which those teachings were transmitted or not transmitted to the faithful. We need to know a lot more about the ways in which ordinary Catholics came to grips with the transformation of American capitalism in the 20th century, uh, from industrial capitalism to the Great Depression to the affluence of the post-Second World War II period to the rise of financialization and deregulation at the end of the 20th century. Catholics in 20th century America go from being primarily working class to having, uh, a, by religious group, um, the highest household income in the United States by 1970, higher than even uh, mainstream Protestants who had traditionally been at the top of the heap. A fruitful avenue of inquiry here, how did ordinary Catholics come to grips? Uh, uh, how do they manage their transition to an affluent society? Another possible avenue of getting at these, and I think it would be a really cool project, and it's suggested to me by the work of another historian who's tried to integrate the economy and religion, Bethany Morton, who did a study of, uh, of, of that um, uh, hybrid religious and economic powerhouse, Walmart. Um, uh, she has a very interesting section in that book about the ways in which Walmart and evangelical Christians began financing business schools in the 1970s. What about Catholic business schools and economics departments? Uh, the places where young Catholics grappled with or didn't grapple with the temptations of modern American capitalism. How did they consider in their curricula, in their classroom discussions, in their student organizations? How did they consider the implications of pap papal teachings on the economy? How did they consider the Second Vatican Council's discussions of the church and the global economy? How did they respond or not respond to the Catholic bishops' well-publicized critique of the American economy published in the 1980s? How did they respond to the crises of deindustrialization and globalization? These are really important questions, uh, and they're questions that compared to some of the ones that I've suggested would probably be fairly easy to research. This leads me to uh, my, my fourth and last area of inquiry, and this is a chronological one. 
The Kushwa Center reflected the, the, the series reflects the center of gravity in American political, culture, cultural, and intellectual history at the time that the books were commissioned and written. That is the period roughly from the second half of the 19th century, really the 1880s or so, up to the middle of the 20th century. A really interesting place to begin to explore the history of Catholicism and its intersection with modern American history is the place of American Catholics in the post-1960s year. When I spoke here at the Kushwa Center in 2008, I suggested that thinking about Catholics in the 1960s was a fruitful avenue of inquiry. It still is, there's a lot more to do. But now, having written a sweeping synthetic overview of American history uh, uh, in the 20th century, uh, and having written four chapters that focus on the period from uh, the late 1960s to the present day, um, I've come to see how that period is central to understanding modern America, and how the momentous cultural, political, and economic shifts of that period cannot be fully understood without putting Catholics in the middle. For example, the 1970s saw Catholic communities, particularly the heavily Catholic cities of the Northeast and Midwest, ravaged by deindustrialization and depopulation. How could Catholics, who had long valued community and local ties, the bounded communities of parish and turf, survive and interpret the profound dislocations of the period? There are some interesting suggestions. Uh, in uh, the late 1970s, President Jimmy Carter brought a group of Catholic communitarians, including Monsignor Gino Baroni and future uh, Ohio Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur onto his urban policy team uh, to help conserve, as the language was used at the time, to conserve fragile urban ethnic uh, communities, which were Catholic communities by and large. Interesting, there's a lot more to learn about this period. Community development corporations that sprung up uh, to try to respond to the ravages of deindustrialization and depopulation uh, were often sponsored, uh, as my student Julia Rabig has found in Newark, for example, by Catholic churches. They play a critical role in imagining how to protect or preserve or save uh, fragile Catholic communities that seem to be disappearing. The 1970s and 1980s also saw profound changes unleashed by the Second Vatican Council come home to American parishes. How did they reorganize and adapt? The brilliant essays uh, edited by uh, Father Joe Cinici, uh, Cinici uh, uh, offer us a, a really powerful approach for grappling with questions of devotion, prayer, and religious practice. Um, how do we think about those questions in a period when young Catholics had grown up when many of the traditional institutions and practices uh, and devotions of the church were up in the air, where they were as likely to encounter, more likely to encounter guitar strumming nuns uh, and masses in the vernacular and priests who asked to be called by their first names uh, than uh, the, the Latin mass or other forms of uh, more uh, time-honored uh, Catholic practice that, that would have been familiar to their parents and grandparents. The 1970s and 1980s is also a period when uh, religious social movements, uh, uh, often led by Catholics, played a really critical role uh, in dissent in the United States, often growing from that fount of engagement of the church and the world uh, in uh, the 1960s. Catholics were central in the anti-war movement of the 1980s, uh, the anti-nuclear movement. Catholics were central in engaging and criticizing American policy toward Latin America. Catholics were directly involved, as my uh, former student, Notre Dame graduate, and now Loyola uh, Marymount professor, the Jesuit Sean Dempsey has discovered, uh, and looking at Los Angeles, were central to nearly every major civil rights, uh, 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 economic rights, uh, and, and, and sexual liberation movement in uh, Los Angeles uh, in the 1970s and 1980s. Wow, we need to know a lot more about them. Finally, the 1970s and 80s raised questions uh, that uh, come up in Madavina, uh, the Madavina volume about the changing color of the Catholic Church, particularly as immigration skyrocketed. Uh, we need to know not just about the ways in which Catholics are part of a transnational set of devotions and practices and beliefs, but what role Catholics played in the profound debates and the policy shifts around immigration uh, that happened in this period. 1986, 
uh, is the signing of the Immigration Reform and Control Act. Uh, Catholics are playing a pretty central role in that. Of all of the really important books that have come out, uh, looking at uh, immigration policy and American political development, many by political scientists, the role of the Catholic Church and of Catholic activists uh, and of new, uh, mostly Catholic immigrants uh, in the, the debate over immigration in the 1980s and beyond uh, is an area that remains uh, woefully neglected. As we look out onto this, uh, this uh, history of 20th century America, we need to, uh, uh, to grapple with the centrality of Catholics, 20 to 25% of the country's population in uh, understanding modern America. It should be, but it is not yet impossible to write modern American history with Catholics left out. Most 20th century American historians and my, myself among them, while I'm trying mightily hard uh, in my new work, have downplayed and ignored religion and its impact. This is still telling evidence of the limitations of uh, American historiography, despite the extraordinary advances and the immensely creative work uh, that's being done. It's time, in other words, uh, for, uh, the, uh, for uh, the Catholic encounter with modern America, the Catholic escape from the ghetto, to be followed by a more nuanced history of modern America's encounter with Catholicism. To consider the feedback loop by which uh, the American Catholic experience was remade by its encounter with America, but perhaps even more so, how the United States in the 20th century would not have been the place that it is, uh, uh, that it became, uh, with out uh, Catholics playing really critical and still understudied and mostly unacknowledged roles. Thank you. Well, I would give you an A, but Scott's a much tougher grader than I am, so I'm going to have to consult with him. So thank you so much for that. Um, okay, to do a few questions? We have time for totally, okay. yeah. Yes, sir. So, um, I mean, it's part of the lecture, but it's coming from work. But I'm interested when you talk about the, um, the urban Catholics in particular group, me being black Catholic. And actually, I see it from the same tent, but I see it a very different um, from a modern standpoint, modern 70s on down from now. Do you think the church have really been inclusionary? for the people of African descent and for the black Catholics here in America. As far as a few offices open up, most of the schools are closed in urban areas. So what do black Catholics have to look for as far as retention and staying in the faith and bringing their faith to their children and future generations? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, uh, and uh, I, 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 as I say, I am not a Catholic historian, but I am a historian of the African American urban experience uh, and of race in the city. Um, and so my answer will be, um, as a consequence of that, not as complete as I would like it to be. Um, and I may be overlooking some really important works that have come out that answer your question more fully than I can. So I give you that caveat to start with. But um, you know, uh, African Americans were treated very much like ethnics uh, in terms of the construction of national parishes, parishes that were built and, uh, you know, to serve what were perceived to be the distinctive needs uh, of the Catholic population, but also uh, to cordon off Catholics uh, uh, by race uh, in, in our metropolitan areas. By the 1960s, yeah, and, and it reinforced patterns of residential segregation by race. By the 1960s and, and 1970s, many of the currents that are reshaping African American politics are sweeping through the world of black Catholics. Calls for uh, a reinforcement of, uh, of, of uh, black Catholic self determination, a recognition of the distinctive black Catholic tradition, uh, the incorporation of African American spirituals into uh, the liturgy, particularly uh, in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, but at the same time, a, a demand by many African-American Catholics who were part of the, Af the African-American freedom struggle, the civil rights movement, for integration more fully into Catholic institutions, uh, into churches, into parishes, into Catholic schools, uh, into Catholic universities. Um, I think this is actually a project that could, uh, could be studied a lot more, particularly for the 1960s period. How do, do the politics of affirmative action play out in Catholic universities?
I don't know. Good question. Let's look at it. Um, how uh, do uh, Catholic universities? Hmm? Yeah, you could start it. Yeah, at any of the and and, and even more so at Catholic institutions or in cities with really substantial African American populations. Let's look at the rise of ethnic studies in African American studies uh, and the ways that it develops on some campuses, but not on others over the course of the period. Um, let's look at the ways in which um, uh, uh, many African American Catholic uh, pastors uh, begin uh, engaging ecumenically with the work of black liberation theologians, many of whom are coming from a Protestant tradition. I think there are a lot of avenues for really rich inquiry uh, at, this, uh, at this critical juncture uh, in the in the period I'm talking about after the, after the 1960s, there's a lot more to be done. Um, the cl closing of parishes and schools, I can opine on this, and I, I have very, as, as, as someone who lives in the city, someone who's right across the street from a Catholic school uh, in Philadelphia that closed about 15 years ago, um, I can give you my New York Times op-ed kind of version of this if you'd like. I mean, I kind of want to keep my historian's hat on, but, but, but you know, um, I, I think in many respects the Catholic Church has failed in its effort to reach out to uh, and um, creatively minister to um, urban populations, and that just doesn't hold true with African Americans, but also Latinos. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, evangelical Protestants are making huge inroads because they've been really creative about proselytizing and coming up with uh, uh, forms. And I know there are many counterexamples uh, in, in Catholicism, uh, but overall, um, I, I, I don't think the church has been pr particularly creative in, um, in thinking about uh, expanding, uh, incorporating, um, dare I say even proselytizing uh, among populations um, um, as it has at particular points in its past, sometimes problematically, sometimes positively with people in other parts of the world. So that's my, that's my op-ed version. Maybe it's National Catholic Reporter op-ed uh, instead of uh, New York Times op-ed. Yeah. Yes. Hey, uh, you, you have said so many nice things about Catholic history. Uh, I feel like I, uh, I feel flattered as a Catholic historian, so I want to flatter you a little bit in return and say that um, this is a related question. One of the things that I really uh, took away with from Sweet Land of Liberty and thought about a lot was uh, at the end of that book, you turn to uh, the ways in which court decisions and laws allow cities and suburban municipalities to, uh, to allow or result in the, their sort of decoupling, right? Services and finances and it, it, segregation of all sorts of things. I thought about that a lot in relationship to the way that Catholics um, structure the church as an institution. And so when you were talking earlier about the first point about boundaries and territory and the second about institutions, it seems to me that there, there's a real distinction because Catholics, uh, Catholic diocesan structures pretty much always encompass both the city and the suburb. Mm -hmm. And so as an administrative unit, they're just working completely differently than uh, local governments are, even as they're overlaid on each other. So I'm, I'm wondering if you could reflect a little bit on that um, in terms yeah. of the that's an excellent question. That's a really good question. And it's one I've, I've, I've thought about. I actually reflected on it um, a little bit. In terms of sort of white flight. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a really smart question. Um, I, I reflected on it in, in my essay for the Cushwa Center volume on Catholics in the American Century. Um, when I thought about um, the paradox of Catholic suburbanization and the ways in which Catholics were part of the suburban project, which was a part, especially in that critical period from the 1940s to the 1970s, a, a project of racial separation, right? And many Catholics kind of looked through their rear view mirrors, both wistfully but also with horror, um, at what they saw as their um, declining neighborhoods and parishes. Um, because Catholic archdioceses are mostly metropolitan or sometimes even regional, um, they have a possibility that a lot of urbanists have suggested as a way of overcoming the, the binary between city and suburb or that division of power and resources across city and suburban lines. But uh, this is suggestive, and I, I reflect on this in, in that essay. Um, uh, Catholics also fought uh, to uh, about the, the about school tenant zones and about the drawing of boundaries and over questions of taxation um, that reflected ways in which 
even as they accepted the territorialization and the kind of the parish boundary idea, um, they wanted those boundaries to, 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 to be firm and hard when it came to city boundaries. They, they, in other words, there was a conflict between two different understandings of Catholic space that play out. And suburban Catholics, I think as many suburbanites did, were willing in some ways to jettison um, part of their older sense of turf and turf consciousness and orientation um, as they um, encountered um, the suburban world. I mean, that's not the only thing that's happening. I mean, they're not just abandoning their turf consciousness and their sense of parish in, in the suburbs because, of, uh, because they're, they're fleeing the city and want to cordon themselves off from the city. It's also happening when traditional Catholic authority is under siege, when the idea that Catholics should um, participate in a marketplace of religion and exercise their choice to go to maybe parishes that aren't uh, uh, where they live as a way of finding the, the place that kind of speaks to them the most. So the, the people are, are, are beginning to complicate and mess with uh, or, or subvert those boundaries for any number of reasons. But I think in the context of race and civil rights and metropolitan politics, the church has the possibility of being a bridging institution that connects together an entire metropolitan or regional area. Uh, but uh, as with so much of Catholic history that I've learned from this series and others, there's a disjoint between, uh, between doctrine or, uh, or, or, or theology or ideals and practice, and we have to constantly be attentive to the, to the tensions between the two. Cecilia. Uh, well, thank you for the talk. And as someone who's not either, uh, who is neither a Catholic historian nor has read those 3,000 pages, although I'm very tempted to now, um, I, I've learned a lot. But I want to pick up on your, if I understand you, understood you correctly, it was a critique of an overemphasis on agency of a certain kind, right? And, um, it seemed to me that you might have been conflating a little bit individual and movement agency mm -hmm. and fatigue. And then I want to move to the last part of your talk in which you especially focus on the 70s and 80s. And it seems like we absolutely then would need to go to a particular kind of agency, uh, communal agency, really to do the kinds of things you're, you're suggesting and to bring Catholics into that history. So are you suggesting a ra radically different understanding of agency? Are you, how do, how do you square that? That's a great question, and I, I think it's, it, is, it is a problem maybe of the looseness of the term. When I said agency, I was thinking about individual agency, and I was thinking about the ways in which um, histories, particularly in the subfields in which I work, um, civil rights history, often single out kind of extraordinary individuals, leaders, um, really put a lot of emphasis on leadership and charisma, not just of Martin Luther King level, but even down to the very grassroots level, right, focusing on uh, or they focus in the way that maybe um, historians like George Lipsitz and Robin D.G. Kelly do um, on um, individual uncoordinated acts of resistance or transgression to the status quo and see in there kind of the seeds of, of, of really significant political transformation. So, so what, what, what you're kind of talking about, this more collective sense or communal sense of agency, um, I, I firmly agree with. I mean, um, that's why I think institutions matter, whether they be non-governmental organizations or at activist groups or community uh, uh, organizations or block clubs or um, all of these kind of intermediate institutions do exercise an agency. They do have a really important impact on shaping the trajectory of, of, of public policy and politics. One of the fundamental things I explore in my work, and I think it has a lot of relevance to, uh, to Catholic history, and is borne out actually in, um, particularly in the studies of labor and, uh, and ethnicity and Catholic politics in a number of the books in the Kushwa Center series, is the ways in which we need to see um, grassroots activists shaped and constrained, bounded by the, uh, by the economy, by political institutions, by laws, by ideology and intellectual discourse, but they're also acting on it and they're changing it. They're pushing at the boundaries of it. They're shifting it. Um, the two are constantly in a kind of a, 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 a dialogic relationship or a feedback loop relationship. And so that's where agency, that, that's the kind of agency I would call maybe the, what you call collective agency. Um, that is people working as a collective, whether it be through the parish or through a national civil rights organization to try to change politics. And they have limitations. They don't usually succeed, or they partially succeed. Uh, and that those partial successes are in large part because of the ways in which institutional rules, boundaries, and structures constrain the options available to them. So I'm really interested, in other words, in this complicated relationship between the possibility of change and the reality of constraint. And I think we see that really powerfully in a number of the Kushwa Center Catholic histories. 
John. I had a question about agency too, and I want to frame it properly. Um, I heard you saying, and I think you may have just repeated it very eloquently, uh, the historians of the 70s, 80s, 90s were so focused on agency that they missed the importance of institutions. And therefore, that's one reason they may be downplayed the importance of Catholicism. Catholicism is so centrally an institutional expression in the United States. Is that accurate? Yes. And then, and I thought, well, but if I think about the exciting books, to the extent that I know of them in the last 15 or so years, actually the idea of agency has been really diminished. Mm -hmm. And we might have, I think I heard a little Daniel Rogers in this comment there. We might totally. Have that. Uh, so if you think about the histories of capitalism, yeah. uh, they're not inclined to give people, enslaved people, ordinary workers, much sense of agency. Mm -hmm. You think about the history of the environment. That's actually a world in which individual agency doesn't play that big a role mm -hmm. in ecological things. If you think about the history of disease. So are we at a different moment now uh, where what I took from you to be a, a little critique of a romantic view of agency, that the heroic leader can solve the problem when in fact the structures are more important. Are we at a moment now when people talk about structures more seriously? Yes. Um, definitely. Maybe I'm fighting an old fight here uh, in that discussion, but um, what I would say is this. Um, there's a growing emphasis on structures, whether it be environment, whether it be political institutions, whether it be the macroeconomy, whether it be the relationship of capitalism and slavery. But it's not the hegemon in, uh, in, in modern American historiography, I think. Um, uh, that is, um, there's still a lot of pushback against it. Um, if you read, say, the reviews of Baptist's book on slavery, which got a lot of favorable reviews, it also got a lot of pushback for essentially saying that the slaves are powerless pawns who have no role in constructing their life. I think there's some kind of middle ground uh, that we need to consider um, that the totalizing histories of, you know, the environmental histories that see humans as grains of sand in a, you know, an, an eons long unfolding of, of, uh, of, of climate and natural processes, I think is, 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 is just as problematic as, as ones that see, you know, um, some individual engaged in one transgressive act as somehow being on the vanguard of a, of a, of a, of a major transformation. So ultimately my disposition as a historian is to be synthetic and really try to put um, that structural approach and that more grassroots or agency approach together. So uh, let's make it concrete and then I'll, I'll be quiet. But good. So You're good, John. I, I'm, I'm glad I don't have you as my, as, as my oral examiner for my, uh, my PhD here, but this is, this is good. Here would be a really concrete example. I think it's probably fair to say there's not a single really good book on American history of the 20th century that gives a significant role to Catholic schools. Mm -hmm. Um, and yet you could say that would be one of the biggest collective enterprises mm -hmm. in U.S. history, the world's largest private school system, and a lot of big cities in the world's half to the children, all funded by private money, staffed by religious women. There's an interesting you know, gender dimension to that. In what history of the United States can Catholic schools, for example, play a significant role? Oh, that is a superb question. and. Uh, um, I think uh, whoever's watching this on video uh, on YouTube at some point or the graduate students here um, or even faculty here, doing a big picture history of Catholic education in the United States would be a blockbuster book. The best thing I've read on Catholic education is the book by Tony Brick, who's an uh, education specialist, but formerly really at the Chicago. Not at all historical. Yeah. There's really nothing historical about it at all. It's a contemporary analysis. It's prescriptive. It's, it's, it doesn't have that historical depth that historians of education can bring. History of education is actually kind of a field in takeoff so right my, now. My, it's a pretty exciting subfield. Said, but my, my direct question would be, that, that would be a history of institutions. Okay. Yes, definitely. Because the people who did those schools are kind of nameless, faceless to us, right? They're almost subconsciously, um, you know, in case of religious women, took different names. How do we write a history where that enterprise, an education system that employs, that, that whether uh, educates uh, 20, 30 million people, um, makes sense? Yeah, I, I think we have to look at it. Um, as a lot of Catholic history does at different scopes and scales. So I'm imagining around what that book would look like if I were to write it. And I think I would 
punctuate the book with three critical moments, maybe the 19th century and the struggles that you write about uh, between Catholics and Protestants over um, the function of education in the United States, maybe the early 20th century when immig the immigrant church is building these massive schools, buildings everywhere, and then maybe um, uh, the wow. 1980s and 1990s when Catholic education really drops off super quickly. And I would do it by, by showing us individual schools. Right, to take us down into three different schools uh, to see how those processes play out in microcosm. And then I would step back and look at the religious orders. And I would step back and look at uh, 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 Catholic teaching. Uh, and I'd, I'd, I'd sit back and look at um, the, the schools, the colleges and the seminaries that train the nuns uh, and sometimes the brothers and, and priests who are central to Catholic education. Um, and then I would take us back down again to see how these things are playing out in practice uh, in schools and shifts in curriculum. It'd be a big and complicated book to write because you're also having to deal with changing understandings of curriculum both in the United States and within uh, uh, the Catholic Church itself. But I, I, I almost want to go and write that one now. It's, it's a pretty, it's a, after I finish my book on real estate, I can take on another massive American institution that uh, uh, hasn't really been studied in great detail. But I think paying attention to the territoriality and specificity of Catholic education as well as the big principles would be the way to do it. Yeah. Well, we all have a lot to do now. So thank, thank you, you so much. For thank you. Work. And thank you for your great questions and especially for tolerating a uh, uh, an outsider making tentative forays into the field of Catholic history. So thank you.